So hi, this is the first video for the um, first Ask an Expert session at the end of uh, week three. So I've, I've gone to the Ask an Expert page where you posted your questions and I, I've ordered them by likes. So these are the three top liked questions from Alan Nicholsby, Jerome Tissier and Eduardo Romani. So I'll just answer them in turn. Um, the first question was from Alan Nicholsby, uh, which is, how will supercomputers develop in the future? Will they continue to increase in size performance like particle accelerators or newer technologies replace them? And that's a really, really interesting question. So we touch on this in the, in the final week with the exascale. So the currently, um, supercomputer performance is, is counted in the petaflops, maybe the tens of petaflops. The next level is the exaflop, which is three orders of magnitude um, faster than the petaflop. And there are some fundamental limits which we approach there. And the main one is um, power consumption. If you believe that we, you have to have a computer which operates on a few tens of megawatts of power, that's really an engineering limit, the fact that it's hard. Most data centers, most computer centers can't bring in more than, you know, well, in the UK, we're limited about five megawatts where Archer is, but with a bespoke facility, you might expect to get 20 megawatts. So people are saying, you know, what's the biggest computer we can build with a, with a power budget of 20 megawatts? And people think that in a few years' time, we could get to the exascale with current technology. Now, there will need to be developments in current technology, mainly around, um, I guess, two aspects. One is just power consumption. And so we're gonna have to start using a much more low power processors. But the hope there is that technology is coming from really two streams. One is uh, from your sort of mobile phone market where they um, produce very, very power efficient processors. Uh, also from the, the, the sort of graphics, the accelerators market where we're seeing um, a lot of effort going to producing very, very fast uh, GPUs, which we can use in supercomputing, but they're also very power efficient. So a combination of these two kind of technologies, more efficient accelerators and more efficient processors, people think that we, we can get to an exascale with, with, the, with the current architecture. It will require a huge number of processors and any, um, any program you run will have to be able to run on, on millions, not tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, but on many millions of um, simple cores at once. Um, but people think we can do it. So at least to the extra scale, um, the next um, level in performance, people think we can do it with current technology. The challenge there, though, is really in software. I'm saying, you know, that kind of machine will, will have millions of simple CPU cores. And the challenge is as a programmer, how do I program such a machine? And a lot of people feel that actually, it's the programming technology, the current approaches of fairly standard approaches like message passing uh, might not, or at least MPI as a library for message passing might not scale to that level. So we might need to use, look at new technologies, uh, new software technologies, possibly simpler versions of message passing, simpler versions of MPI to reduce the memory footprint because one of the big things which uses up lots of power is, is, is the memory. And we, when we have millions of CPU cores, they're not going to have much memory, at least per core. The whole machine may have a lot of memory, but each CPU core may not. May not. So we may need to use new approaches there. The other big thing we're going to hit the exascale is reliability. Um, I mean, at the moment, our programming model is that the computer, our supercomputer is there working correctly all the time. And when you go to these vast numbers of cores, it, it's very unlikely to imagine that they will all work for, for, the, for many hours at once. And so if hardware is failing, how are we going to cope with that? Is that going to be done in hardware or probably we're going to need to have more robust uh, programming models? We're going to, to, to use machines of that scale, uh, we're going to have to have versions of message passing, versions of the MPI library, which, which allow the programmer to cope with, with fault tolerance. And so, so they're, they're two kind of, that, that's the real issue. For the exascale, people think that we can use current technology, but the challenge is going to be in the software side. Beyond that, I don't know. I mean, one analogy you might use, and this is being a bit, you know, of a devil's advocate playing things down, is, is commercial aircraft. I mean, aircraft are developed, commercial aircraft start to be used in the 40s and the 50s, and we get faster and faster airliners carrying people. And then people just say, well, you know, people want to go faster, so people build something like Concorde, more than twice the speed of sound. And that turns out not to be commercially viable. For the past, you know, three or four decades, the, the, the uh, technology, the advances have been in not building faster commercial aircraft, but building aircraft which fly at under the speed of sound, but much more efficiently. They're more power efficient, cheaper, can, can, more reliable, take more people. They might be very large or more flexible in some way. 
And so possibly, you know, when we reach the limit of current technology, if new technologies don't come along, maybe what will happen is we'll stick there at the exaflop. And then, but these will just become more affordable, more usable, more cheaper to run. Um, but that is a very good question. I haven't given you a definitive answer there, but I hope I've given you something which, which at least addresses your question. And we can look at this again when we come back to, um, to Exascale. I mean, there are technologies like quantum computing, which are completely new. Uh, but as we'll see when we touch on it in the final week, they are potentially excellent solutions for a small class of problems. But at the moment, they don't look like they're applicable to, to the large class of computational science problems which we talk about in this course.